Hello, builders of good. Thank you for tuning in to the Build Good Fundraising Podcast. Fundraising isn't easy, but it should be simple. So on this show, we take the mystery out of raising money. And on every episode, we coach you to build your fundraising like a flywheel. The flywheel has five parts. Number one is listening to donors. Number two is engaging donors. Number three is asking the right people for the right things. Number four is celebrating every gift. And number five is reporting back in a real time and responsive way. If you master the five parts of the flywheel, your fundraising flywheel will start to spin reliably. You will, with less effort on your part, you will grow your revenue and you'll grow your career as well. Now, every week we focus on one part of the flywheel. And today, well, today we're kind of focusing on asking, but kind of on the other parts as well, because we're going to be talking about something that most of the time doesn't get talked about in fundraising, which is search engine optimization. (laughs) Search engine optimization, SEO, what is that? Well, more people might give to your organization if they could actually find you or if they actually knew that you existed. We do talk on this podcast a lot about paid ads, about emails, about organic social, about direct mail. Those are all great ways to reach new potential donors. But some of the scrappiest nonprofits are using SEO to attract new supporters to grow their cause. How? Well, that's what we're getting into today with our guest, Cameron Bartlett. Cameron has helped hundreds of charities like yours fundraise way more by creating journeys that guide donors from your first interaction to becoming lifelong advocates that grow your cause for you. He's led award-winning digital marketing campaigns for orgs like New Story, IJN, Compassion International, World Vision, and Cure. And he is currently building his own nonprofit, a startup called Future food. So let's get right into it. Here's my chat with Cameron. Hey, Cameron. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Good. Thank, thanks for coming on the pod. I, I, you and I chat on the phone every now and again, but it's good to finally yeah. have you on here. Yeah, that's really great. Mike, you sound great through that microphone, by the way. And that pitch you just gave was awesome. Like, I love <laughs> that you walk everyone through this flywheel and like the simple steps. They're brilliant. So good. Cool. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about SEO. And you are you occupy this interesting positioning in my mind. Typically, typically you think of somebody, you think of like one specific thing. And when I think of you, I think of like four or five things where you do really, really well. So you've you've really, you know, in my mind at least, you're like positioned as this expert in almost all things digital fundraising and marketing. But SEO is a big one because not a lot of people talk about SEO. You're really good at it. So how well, about we spend a little bit of time getting into that? Absolutely. I'm sure part of that too, Mike, is it's just like this series of just like every week I was posting something about SEO for nonprofits for like three months or something like that. So I'm sure you saw a bunch of those. And I think those are a lot of the things that we'll talk about today. Some really great ways. Like you mentioned, scrappy nonprofits. And that doesn't mean of any size, like that could be any size, right? Small nonprofits, they're like, how do we do something without the budgets of a larger nonprofit or a bigger nonprofit? It's like, hey, we have a lot of resources and so forth, but like, how do we get really thrifty here? How do we actually like find ways to invest without using big budgets and still get great, great results? And so SEO is one of those things. It's, it's a long game for sure. Like it's something that you invest in over time. But once you have built a strategy, it's something that keeps giving back and keeps allowing you to grow. And and it can make up for other strategies that aren't working. I think of one really good example, right? I was working with an organization called the Exodus Road. And it was during we were running ads that we had relied upon for gaining, I think, about a thousand new leads a month from Facebook and Instagram ads and and some YouTube and so forth. But when we, we were going through a time where we as a social issue a nonprofit, Facebook has that that label and it, and it ropes in anything from like, you know, humanitarian work to political work. And so because it's all in that one category, it was during an election. And so we, they kind of paused all, uh, all social issue ads during that time. So we really relied on not just the lead generation, but obviously like donor acquisition and so forth. And so because we couldn't run ads on Facebook and Instagram, which was such a big hit, we said, hey, what if we invest in our organic search strategy instead? It's something different. I don't, I don't think we'll see the same kind of results, but let's just see what we can do. And in just a short period of time, just a few months, 
we were able to increase our search traffic by four times, making up for almost all of those thousand leads we would normally be getting and new donors were coming in because of it. In fact, we even, I remember like a sitting, opening this check for from a donor that had found us through Google, like just searching and being like human trafficking nonprofits, found us, started doing their research and donated a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 on this check. And when we asked them why, it was because of the search strategy that we had come up with and other content and so forth that led them to actually giving. And it was really, really amazing. So for your nonprofit of any size, like you can do these same types of things. Yeah. So you already mentioned that this is a search strategy. We're going to get into that. So here's, here's, I tried to write some teasers for the podcast and I tried to write them in a way that were good for SEO. So (laughs) since I got you on the call, here's what I wrote. Why is SEO important for your nonprofit? How does SEO for nonprofits even work? How can you begin optimizing your online content so more people find you? How can you identify relevant keywords for your charity? How long does it take to see results from your nonprofit's SEO efforts? What tools can a nonprofit use for SEO? And how can you track and measure your progress on your SEO efforts? Now, the reason I think all of these are important to get into is because I went to Google and I started typing (laughs) like, you know, the, the autocomplete, which shows you what people are searching for on SEO. And then I asked ChatGPT, what are the most common questions people might have about SEO and nonprofits? So we're going to get into that is, is how do you have a search strategy so you know how to change the words you use on your website, on your blog post, everywhere else? Changing the words you use is free. Yeah. And the way you change those words has an impact on how people find you when they go and search for a topic. So let's start here. What is SEO? Give us a, give us a quick primer. Yeah, absolutely. So these strategies are built off of how you can create great content on your website that people will organically find through search, you know, and even through times like now where we have generated AI and people are using ChatGPT and so forth, how can you stand out and allow when someone searches for an answer to something, they find you. And it doesn't, you know, some people think it's, it's only for instance, write to a donation. So like you're thinking, let's just write articles and have content on our website and landing pages that are directly related to like, I want to donate to an education nonprofit. Like very few people are searching that. You know, we got lucky with this guy who actually was searching for that. In most cases, you're going to want to figure out who your audience is and what types of things they're going to be searching for. You know, so when we're at, when I was doing this for Compassion International, for instance, we were creating resources for, for families with young children. And so it would be like great articles about even just like crafts to do around the holidays and things like that, which seemed completely out of left field, right? Like, why would we be doing that kind of stuff? But people would then come to the website, they'd engage with that content, they'd download some of our stuff, they'd join our email list, and we'd be able to follow up with them if we knew that if they really cared about their children, their grandchildren, and were investing in like time with them and doing these crafts together and all that stuff, recipes from different countries where we were working, things like that. We made it really fun and engaging. So it wasn't just like really clear, like direct answers about like really stark statistics or something. It was something fun and engaging and it led to a lead generating tool, which will be a really key part of what we talked about today. But but then we were able to, to generate donors because of it. So you're really trying to figure out, yeah, some of those direct things that people are searching that can bring them to your website and show your solution for that. But also... Uh, things that are just related to your target audience. Like who is your ideal donor? If you have that like donor avatar, like you've figured out who that profile of that person is, what are they generally searching for and how can you be the solution and the resource for that? Right. Yeah. So if your children's charity and your ideal donor might be a young family or might have grandkids, things they might be searching for. It's a good example. If you're a mental health charity, maybe it's people mm-hmm. who are looking for mental health resources or how to support a family or a friend who, who is facing some of those issues. If you're an environmental organization, there might be searches around that, like, you know, how how, how can I preserve this or or maybe even around specific animals that are endangered, things like that. Yeah, you could even have lists of products that are more environmentally friendly or greener or ethically sourced. Like lists like that were really, really big. Like we had uh, products or like ethically sourced fair trade, you know, Rainforest Alliance chocolates and things like that. Those are articles that people loved reading those lists and engaging with that type of content coming to our website and realizing like, hey, if I'm somebody who cares about things that are ethically sourced, I care about the, the people who are involved in the supply chain. 
I care about ending labor, human trafficking, labor slavery, right? And so they were ideal donors to come to our website and find those resources. One thing I'd love to start with actually, that is a really, is a really, could be really easy for you if you have some of these things in place is you, you might just want to search and figure out if you, your charity this website is accidentally good at SEO. I've actually seen this a number of times where like somebody told them at some point, write articles or your website's just lived there for a while. And a lot of other websites have linked to it. You've been featured in different you know publications. And so you've been getting great like search traffic just organically to your website, but it's not, it just doesn't have a strategy behind it. And so you might accidentally be good at this. And so what I do is use a tool, you know, for instance, I love using Moz, Hrefs, like there's a bunch of great ones out there. Moz specifically, I mentioned because it's an article on my website about like software discounts for nonprofits. I am avid about like every time I look into a software, like emailing the team, if they just not on a page about it already, like, hey, do you guys offer a nonprofit discount? And sometimes they'll give you one. Moz just has one already. It's like 75% off their tool. It's amazing. I've had it for years. I pay, I don't know if you can still get this deal, but I think I pay like 30, I got a better deal. I think I pay like $30 for like their, I don't know, almost $200 a month plan. And, And so anyways, if you get a tool like this and you can search through your website, you can see what pages are already ranking, right? So you can see, hey, your article on, you know, 10 facts about like, global poverty or something like that is ranking because people are searching like, you know, how many, you know, you know, how many people in the world live below the $2 line or something like that, right? Someone's searching those things and your article is coming up fourth or fifth or sixth. And so, you know, I found some organizations that like had, I was working with this one, but they had some article that was so highly trafficked, but it wasn't like really related to what they were doing and they couldn't figure out a way to use it. But we were able to figure out one, how to relate it to the work they were doing, how to create a lead generating tool around it. So like when someone gets to that website or that webpage, having a reason for them to enter in their email address so they can join your list and so forth. And then you have a bunch of free people just coming to your website and joining your list. And then we were able to optimize the existing page. So this is what you can do. If you find that your website, and it might not be, if you don't, if you don't have a lot of great search traffic right now, then it just means you get to start the strategy now and start building. But if you do, you can start to really optimize your existing content. That means going back through and making sure everything's up to date, making sure things like links are sending to existing pages. That is a really common thing. You'll have links from you know three or four years ago that are going to a web page and that website now changed something and that's not how their URL is structured. That page doesn't exist. And so you know you want to make sure it's it's accurate, it's sending to the right places, that the answers you're giving in the article actually are still relevant as well. And then a really great thing you can do when you're optimizing existing content. So this is, you know, like as now as well as down the road, when you're looking at things in six months or a year, you can look at what the top articles for those search terms you know, look at the content and then start to mimic some of those things like, oh, do they use a lot of photos? You know, do they have a video at the top so people are sitting there and watching it for a bit? Is it actually just straight, you know, mostly text and like a bunch of really resources of links and so forth that lead to other places? You know, things like that are really helpful for it, you know, optimizing your existing content. Um, and then, you know, like there are a bunch of other things as well, but I would start there and see, does your nonprofit already have have some traffic that's coming to your website to certain pages and can you start to do the things to signal to google and to and to search visitors that your resources are really valuable and that they should actually start moving up in rankings meaning you'll get more traffic more leads and more potential donors yeah all right so moz is a tool that somebody can use to actually see which of my pages what 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 content that i already have is already ranking and getting a lot of traffic yes yeah and I'm- then and then that'll tell you, hey, maybe I'm getting more traffic than I thought I was. I never even looked at it. Yeah. So maybe the next step is, okay, how can I convert some of that traffic into like an email address or something? And we'll get exactly. there with the lead generating piece. But if we're not there, if our site is really not, we're not getting a lot of traffic at all, but it sounds like, you know, paid ads are getting more expensive. Zuckerberg could change his mind tomorrow and the rules <laughs> change. And when you were able to run social cause sort of ads before, all of a sudden you're not allowed to. Um, mm-hmm. it, you're on rented land and you lose it all overnight. So, okay, this sounds like maybe we should start having an owned land strategy, which is like the real estate that we own is our website. Maybe we should start having a strategy around what we should do on there. 
how can we start with SEO optimization? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the first thing you want to do is figure out what your website should rank for. Like what is, there's a difference between like the uh, more generalized terms and the, you know, like more specific terms. They're called short tail or long tail. That's because if you're going to, you know, short tail is going to be something like shoes. Long tail is the longer version of that. That's more specific. So, you know, women's running shoes, you know, Nike or something like that, right? That's the longer tail version. So you want to start with what your website's main keyword should be. And you want to, you know, consider a couple of things. For instance, like if you're a water charity, you don't just want to be water, right? Because then you're going to be competing with Poland Springs and everybody else, right? You're, you know, you're also going to be competing with like Hydro Flask and Stanley water bottles, right? So like you want to make sure that your your main keyword is is broad enough that it you can do a lot of stuff with it, but you can have a bunch of long tail versions of it, but not so broad that you're inviting every kind of traffic. So, you know, Charity Water might be like, you know, obviously they're, they're trying to get their branded keyword of their name, right? Charity Water, but also then they would be, you know, Water Charity or something along those lines, right? But from there, you know, so this, that first step can be kind of simple. From there, you want to figure out what people are searching around that topic. Again, you're thinking about what is related to your nonprofit and what you offer, but also what your audience is looking for. So you get to go through this great brainstorming phase. You mentioned just typing it into Google. That is a great place to start. I actually I had the opportunity to teach a class at UNC Chapel Hill on digital marketing. And when we got to SEO, that was like the first thing we said was just go to Google, right? And like type in you know, your, your phrase and see what suggestions come up. And that will be, this is what people search very often. So that's one thing you can do. There's an, another, another tool. I think it's changed names a couple of times. I think it's called answer the public right now. I think Neil Patel owns it. Neil Patel has a great SEO resources as well, but that is one that will kind of like mind map. If you type in a, a topic, it'll tell you a bunch of different questions that people are asking about that topic. You can also use, there are free tools like Google has one. If you just set up an ad account, again, you don't have to even spend any money, just set up an ad account that you're going to use. They have a a tool called their keyword finder, I believe it's called. And so that's free. You can just, again, type in search terms and it'll start to show you what people are searching and also how many people are searching for it. When you're finding those keywords, right, especially the longer tail ones, the, you know, the women's Nike shoes, right? You want to be able to look for two factors. Okay. So one is you want to look at how much traffic it's getting, right? You want to make sure that it's getting a lot of traffic and ideally it would have low competition. That doesn't always happen, right? Because of course the thing, the, the words that a lot of people are searching for a lot of companies and nonprofits and people are, are trying to get those words. So an ideal scenario is that you found one that has a lot of search traffic, but no one's quite ranking for it yet. No one's really competing for it yet. And so tools like that keyword planner or Moz or Ahrefs or, you know, the different tools like that will, uh, Neil Patel has one called, I think it's Uber Suggest. And anyways, any of these tools will help you determine which ones are getting a lot of people searching for them, but not a lot of people competing for them. That is an ideal one to find. So start, I would start there. Okay. So let's say we do those things. We do a bit of research. We figure out things that people that are ideal donors, people who might care about our cause. These are some things that they're searching for. And I liked your your example before of compassion with children's charity, um, people looking for activities to do with kids, or how can I teach my kids about X? Like, how can I teach my kids about poverty? Or how can I teach my kids about generosity? Or exactly. how can I involve my kids in this? Or what can I do with my kids at Christmas? You know, whatever. Like those are all, let's say we've got, we've got an idea. Maybe we came up with seven to 10 things that we think these are things that are fairly low competition, high search traffic that would fit our audience. Mm -hmm. We've got those. Fantastic. What's next? Yeah. So now that you have the topics, you start to kind of group them together. So you make a map, right? You start with your your main keywords and your longer tail keywords, and you start to group them into these topic clusters, right? And so then you can create content based off of that. So again, you might want to determine which pages already exist on your website that you want to rank for those things. 
or which new content you want to create. So, you know, your page that is, you're a food charity and your, your page that is on like facts about hunger or something like that. That's the one you want to rank for several of those terms, maybe that people are searching for the, for an answer to facts about poverty and, and, and hunger specifically, right? Then you're like, oh, well, we don't have anything right now on our website that really talks about X topic. So we're going to create a new article or a new landing page based off of that. Now, what you can do is because you've created these topic clusters, you probably have a bunch of leftover, like long tail keywords that you're like, we got to fit these in somewhere. Sometimes you can add them all into one related article. So you might have some that is really easy for you to say like, all right, well, we have, we have this topic cluster. We're going to write that into five articles. Sometimes you can say, I bet we could make this into one article because all of these are so related that we could, we could kind of put them into one. And in that case, you just start writing things and you can use some of those other keywords as your, as the format. So, you know, you're writing something and I feel like the on the spot answers are going to be not good. <laughs> you write, let's just go back to shoes because it's nice and easy, right? You're writing and you're like, you're writing an article about, you know, running shoes and in that you're going to you're going to write in there maybe a topic that's like how to you know people might ask questions like which shoes are most durable and won't you know because you're running a lot and there's a lot of friction and you're going to like wear through the shoes which ones will last longer well then then another topic it might be like how important is it to have light shoes while you're running so that you can run longer distances well you might also say like uh, in that same article, how important is arch support as you're running, right? And so now each of those are different topics within the article that answer people's questions that are specifically related to when, how to buy running shoes, the things you want to buy, or things you want to get, think about when, when and consider when, when purchasing them, right? So your article could follow that same format. Now, one other really great thing here, because I want to tie back to it again, is creating a lead generating tool. You might have something that is just really great for your website and it's just working and it's converting and you don't have to specialize it, right? It's just like, hey, this is something that like we could put on every page of our website and people who are reading any of this content would be interested in. And, and so you could just throughout your web, throughout this article, have little calls to action. That's just like enter your email address, or you can have other tools that help you like create pop-ups and stuff like that. Or you could create content that's specific to this article or a, a cluster of articles or something like that, that you're like, hey, if someone is right now reading about art support for running shoes, like they're going to be interested in a more in-depth resource on like how to, how to find, you know, the right running shoe for you. Right. And so then you create a specialized download or experience or, you know, email series or something that they can sign up for that's specific to that article. That's an ideal scenario. Of course, you don't want to have to like create a new lead gen for every single page you're creating, but you could have a few specialized ones that really cover a whole group of things, you know? So for instance, um, you know, I had a, a nonprofit that was like, they were creating resources for like religious institutions and so forth. And so if they were interested in studies for adults, they might not be interested in studies for, you know, like for children, right? And so like it, we had different resources based off of those different segments, right? And those different articles that had anything to do with like resources specifically for, you know, women's groups or men's groups or things like that was different than we would offer when people were searching for children's resources, Right. And so we didn't, it didn't mean we had to create, you know, one for every page of our website. We didn't have dozens and dozens of different lead opt-ins. We just had a few that, that covered certain categories. And so again, you could either have one that's just super powerful. You're like, look, any page that someone lands on, they're going to opt into this. Great. Use that. But if you feel like, Hey, this content's a little bit outside of what we normally do, we'd really like to create a specialized thing, especially that compassionate example that I gave where we created this, these children's resources really the lead gen, like it should go along with it. And it did, right? Like it was, they were like downloadable, I think like coloring pages and activities and cut out things that you could do at, you know, at home at Christmas time. And you could make like these little ornaments and all, all kinds of fun stuff, but it made sense for that to be the, the opt-in for that, that to be the reason that people were giving their email address because it was so related to the content that they were reading. All right. So we did a bunch of research. We've got keywords. So we've got short tail and long tail. Around long tail, we created some clusters and we came up with like, let's say like three content pillars, like three clusters. These are three main themes. We're going to create content around and we're going to start like writing blog posts that answer some of these questions. 
And then there's going to be a lead generator, that lead generating tool, a resource that, that we got into a little bit already. Let's talk about that a little bit. So what is a lead generating resource? What, what does it look like? What's the idea behind it? How does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So you want to find a way for any visitor that comes to your website, if they're not ready to give, which let's be honest, the first time you visit a website, you're usually not ready to give. And then do you leave that? And then you never come back, maybe. That could happen, right? Like maybe you remember the website. Maybe it was a friend that told you about it. So you can ask that friend again. But in a lot of cases, like especially if someone's just searching and clicking through to you, they might be ending up on your website and then never come back again. So obviously there are ways that you can follow up with them. You could set up like retargeting ads to anyone who visits your website, you know, you shows them the ads. That's great. But again, you're spending money to do that. And we talked about the, the difference of like, you know, running something that's on somebody else's platform, as opposed to you owning an audience, which is what you'd be doing here when you get someone's email address, right? You want to get someone's email address so you can send them through your email automation so you can follow up with them personally if you want to. And when you're running campaigns, they're on your list, like they'll be more likely to give. You want to grow those lists, especially as you get ready for like right now, you're in campaign and so forth, so that we have these. So you're sending out to more people and you're more likely to get more donors out of that, those campaigns. So in order to get someone to sign up, you have to give them a good reason to give you their email address. People are very protective of it. I'm protective of it. I only like subscribe to a few things. They have to really be compelling and give me a good reason to, to, to follow along. You want to figure out what is really specialized to, again, what we talked about, either what the, the content they're reading or who this, this, this particular person is, right? Who your audience is that you're, that you're targeting. So if they're parents, if they're people who care about fair trade goods, if they're people who, you know, any of those number of things or specific to the content that allows them to get a little bit more, you know, I've seen great lead generators, like, you know, there, there could be something like more facts about human trafficking. I've seen work really well for organizations like Exodus Road, Exodus Cry and others like that. I've seen one of my favorites was when I was working with Cure. They had this great lead generator already set up, but and I don't believe they use it anymore, but I think it was brilliant. What it was is you'd be able to write a letter to a kid who's in the hospital and it was really easy to use. Like it took, it took like 15 seconds and they had pre-canned like things that you could write or you could write something personalized. What was really cool about this lead generating tool is that it then created, and this will be kind of what we go into next is like, it created a really valuable follow-up series. So when you wrote a letter to a kid in the hospital, you would then receive a series of emails of updates of like, hey, they just got out of surgery. Like, hey, they're, they're feeling a lot of the weather. Do you want to send them another message? Or, hey, do you want to, you know, like, you know, hey, someone's, they're out and they're running for the first time since, you know, like in their whole life. You know what I mean? Like, you just get to share these really amazing stories um, I remember this this girl, she'd been burned in, in, in a fire that consumed her, her house and her arms were actually fused together. And we get to send this wonderful picture of her finally like being able to put her arms up and like stretch them out. And it was just like, it was such a moving photo. And people who wrote her a letter in the hospital received that. Now, that kind of content is so valuable, whether you've given before or never given you know, like if you, if you've never given, you're like, oh my God, I want to make this happen more often. If, you know, if you already give, you're like, this is why I give, like, I'm, I'm going to tell everybody about this. Right. And so it created this really valuable, like content that was super relevant to the people who had signed up for it. And then had great pitches for people to then give. And people were likely to give, especially because they felt like they already made an impact and they were committed to this, this, this child. And now they're like, oh, let me help them more. Right. So Creating these lead generating tools, again, it could be like five facts about the, your topic area. It could be a resource, like we mentioned, like a downloadable thing for parents and grandparents because that's your related. It could be, you know, heck, it could, you could be writing an article about that chocolate, like I mentioned, and this could be coupons from those companies that you do a partnership with and you download those by entering your email address. And now you go back to get like Tony's Chocolate Only. If you know that chocolate bar, it's really amazing. They're a fair trade and they also give their profits back to then ending slavery, which is really cool. So that's a plug for them. But you could do that. You could do something really fun like that. And now people are entering their email address. They go through a series that, and then you're creating really great relevant content that takes people through some great storytelling and as well as like, relevant to what they, why they had joined and then gives them a reason to give later. Yeah. Love your example of Cure because you're combining, you're using something for lead 
generation, which we often use in direct response to get somebody's email or phone number who's already a donor, which is like in a direct mail appeal. We're often like, it's called a bounce back, send this note back and it goes to a kid or it goes to whatever. And then we're like, and give us your phone number or your, your, your cell phone number. And then we'll text you a picture on the day that something specific happens. So for example, Love that. in a vaccine campaign, it's like, we'll send you a picture from some village somewhere on the day our team sets up the tents to vaccinate a bunch of kids. And so I'd love how you've turned that into a lead. Like you're putting that, typically we're doing that. Somebody has made a gift and we're like, we'd like a little bit more information from them. So this is the value prop, but using that at the very front end, which is a, a great, great tactic. They download a resource. They download a lead generator. Mm -hmm. Now we've got yeah. an email and possibly a first name and likely not more than that. We didn't make them fill out 16 fields to get some sort of resource. <laughs> what happens next? Yeah. Well, one fun thing I love to add in here that's not specifically SEO. It's just a great thing that I always love testing. It's a great digital strategy. It's finding ways to upsell people in whatever you're doing. Right. So for instance, in, in the for-profit space, there's this great strategy where when someone does opt in for a lead, you give them an offer that's just one time. And it's really cool. It's called Tripwire. Right. And yeah. so uh, we tested this out with nonprofits and it works really well. It's really exciting. So what you do is, you know, in most cases, you, you know, let's go back to for-profit for a second. You fill in the lead opt-in and they're like, okay, hey, listen just right now, we're going to give you this thing. It's 80% off. Like it's something that's under $20, you know, normally. And you just say, look, this is the one time it's actually truly like if they left that page, they won't get it again. Right. And I kind of hate these as a user when I go through them sometimes, because I'm like, it's really hard to like say no to them. Right. But they're these great little upsells. And we were able to do this with nonprofits where we say, Hey, look, if you give a gift right now, we actually have a donor that's going to match it. It's just now it's we're going we're to double it. So if you give now, yeah, you'll be able to do that. So really great. Like a lot, like some people, again, everything's down to, is down to like small percentages. You get a certain amount of traffic and a certain amount actually become a lead and a certain amount, maybe become a donor. And so a lot of people would join the list and it might take them months before they came, became a, a donor. And so we wanted to give people that option right now, as they're taking action, as they're seeing that like this content is relevant, make a donation, $5, $10, $20, whatever, right? And we'll match it. And we saw people doing it. It actually started to kind of recoup the cost of some of like our, even the lead ads that we're sending people to those pages. And of course, when it's organic, it's just free anyways. But like we started to see some of those people actually convert, which is really, really cool. Again, then you want to always find ways that people can skip, skip steps too. So you want to make sure like your donation software, when someone gives one time is also seamlessly upselling them to recurring. So you don't want to just, for instance, have something that's just a checkbox. It's like, I want to give one time or recurring because everyone's just thinking like, I'm just, I'm giving $10 right now. That's all I'm doing. Right. But if your donation stuff like first instance fundraise up does this really well, fundraise now does this too. And others where you go to give say it's a hundred dollars. And instead of them being like, Hey, do you want to give that every month? You're like, no, I saved up a hundred dollars. Are you kidding me? I'm not ready to give this every month. Instead they'll say, Hey, what if you gave $25? A month though. And they're like, well, I guess, I mean, I already have the hundred dollars saved up. I'm ready to give this right now. Like maybe I'll just give a little bit and I can keep this 75 and then I can just do this every month. And now in a year, you know, they've given three times as much, right? Like, and so always finding ways that for, at every stage that people can keep skipping steps. So that's one thing I would start with. Yeah. And then your question was like, if once we have their lead information, what do we do? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what do we do then? The, the 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 good call out on on the page they land on though, right after they download the resource, it's a huge opportunity because people don't know once they download the resource, they give you the email and they hit the button. They don't know if the resource is next or if the resource is going to be emailed to them. So everybody is going right. to go to whatever page you send them to. They're going to spend a bit of time there. It's the next mm -hmm. step in the journey. You called it a tripwire. Sometimes it's called a self-liquidating offer. I hate that I term that. in terms never of heard that. fundraising, <laughs> but it's like, it's like, yeah, this thing is here. It's nowhere else. And it, it is self-liquidating. Like if 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 you're not going to buy it here, it's not offered anywhere else. Oftentimes this is an in info products where you get like upsells too. Well, you can also get the physical version or you can also get the audiobook version or you can whatever. Yes. We've done a PDF children's book and then and then the the tripwire or the self-liquidating offer was the actual physical book for yes. us. So you've downloaded the PDF. We'll send you the actual book for an amount, right? And you mentioned about it's a good good time to add in a matching gift as long as you do it ethically. Yeah. 
Um, make sure yeah. that you, you, the donor who's matching the gift, be like, this is an experiment. Here's how we want to use it. We want mm -hmm. to acquire leads. And then we want to use your funds to match people on this specific page. Those are the funds that we want to match. As long as that's yeah. all done ethically and, and you're not just, yeah. you know, you got to pull back the marketer in yourself who's a geek <laughs> about trying it out and make sure you do it like ethically and it's all, all on the up and up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I love that book example too. I've actually seen that work really well. And it's so, it's so great to get something physically in people's hands, especially as a digital marketer. Like I love when that's possible. And so now you're like, Hey, here's a digital, a lot of people will do. They'll like, Hey, our founder wrote a book. I see that a lot as a lead generating tool. And it, and sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it's not super great. So you really have to make sure it works for your audience. But when it does, like people, you know, like it could be there a book or even like a documentary that was made or any of those things. And now you get to go watch it or, or read it. And now the physical copy is an option. I really love it, especially when you can be like, Hey, look, we would be fine with sending out the physical versions of these books and having people like basically just cover the cost of it. You know what I mean? Like cost of the book and maybe in shipping and so forth, but like, we're not making any money on this. Like, even if you do that, sometimes it's still worth it because then it makes it really easy for someone to say yes to it. And then you get something in their hands and then they like see it on themselves. Like again, as a digital marketer, I love like also seeing ways that you can you know, tie in like physical goods and so forth to the experience. Yeah. So and then, you, and then uh, you've got their great. address. And, and then you've got their address. address. Yeah. That's smart. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So once they're on your list, like you do want to make sure you create a series. Like I mentioned, sure had this wonderful series that it was talking about the work they did, but then also had those built-in updates on that specific child that you just written a letter to. And because they're in the hospital, like that, that update is going to come soon, right? Like they're going in for surgery in two days, right? And so you're going to hear from them and then they're going to follow up with their doctor in four weeks or whatever it is, right? So if you, you have those things built in. You want to make sure that you have a series and automation, you know, that, that, that comes afterwards. So for, I'd love to know, like, what what do you all use for email tools? Like, in here in the audience, like, do you use Mailchimp? Do you use HubSpot? Do you use Constant Contact? Like, what are the what are the tools that you all use? Because any of those have options for you to be able to to. Let's see, I'm like, oh, I thought Mike, you were sharing what you use. <laughs> but I had the comments. Yeah, the, you, any of those have options for you to not just send out a blast of an email, but I'm sure you know this an email series that is automated, that have, that's triggered when someone fills out that form. And so you want to be able to send out, you know, two or three, maybe up to, up to five emails just from that, that lead generating process, but also like you might have a standard welcome series. So in some cases you just send people right into your standard welcome series, or in some cases you would go and add in like a couple of emails in between because this is specific content. It's specialized to what they just downloaded. Again, if you just are using one lead generating tool, it's a lot easier, but if you have a lot of varied content and you feel like you'll get more people to sign up, if you specialize that content, like we talked about, then you also want to specialize the email series that comes afterwards. In that, of course, you want to give people the option to donate in there, but you really want to welcome them in, tell them great stories, show them impact, talk about other donors and their experience, things like that, right? But what's great about having people on this list now, like I mentioned, is leading up to your big campaigns, right? Like people, as you create these evergreen strategies, people will give, right? Like you'll have some people who go right from an ad to give, go right from search to fill out the form to like you know, donate in the email series that will happen, but most people will give it during a campaign. So what you want to be able to do is send them through the welcome series, but then have great, and this is getting a little bit into email marketing here, but have great content in between that. And when you ask during the campaign, and I like to call this, I'll reference this, I think in our other conversations too, but celebration content, right? I mentioned it when the little girl, like was able to finally like release her arms and like hold them up and so forth. Um, this is when you can really show the impact of your work. And I would, wherever possible, whenever possible, ditch just the standard newsletter and use this as an opportunity to share impact stories, thank donors, show them what they're doing and, and treat everyone in that list like the same, give them all the same content and let them see like, whether they're a long-term donor, they get to be like, yeah, that's me. I've been doing that for a bit. Like, I am so glad I support this organization. Or there's someone who's like, I want to be, I want to feel like the people that they're calling out in these emails. I want to feel, I want to feel like I'm, you know, I made this happen as well. I want to give, right? So really spending time thanking people, 
So that way you can build up to times like your year end campaign, giving Tuesday and other points throughout the year where you plan, hey, these are the campaigns we're doing that building that email list will be really key. But also one other thing, building up just your web traffic in general. Remember if you, you all of this that I ever talk about is tying in to an integrated donor journey, bringing people step-by-step step and allowing to, to have a journey that guides them to actually becoming a donor. And then even an advocate that helps grow your cause for you. Well, when someone visits a page, if you have the right tracking on your page through you know, Facebook and Instagram and Google and YouTube and so forth, you can retarget people who've, who've been to your pages. And we did this during campaigns like, you know, we had this campaign at IJM called Super Marco, and it was about this new form of slavery called cyber sex trafficking. And it was new. It was something that we were just talking to people about in that year. And so when we created the content throughout that year, we, we had pages on our website, landing pages, but also articles and, and uh, rescues and news, news publications and all these different things that we were referencing in our website. And when people would visit those pages, we would be able to retarget people specifically who we knew had, who had engaged because you know it had cyber sex trafficking in the URL or something like that, or pages that were related to that. So you are building up an email list and web visitors to certain pages that are qualifying them to know more about the specific type of casework you're doing or that specific topic that you're running a campaign on is really, really valuable. Yeah. We're about to get into questions, but the last question I have is around tracking and measuring your SEO efforts. Obviously, you're going to be able to see if your traffic starts to pick up and you're going to be able to measure yeah, how many leads are we getting? How many people are converting and giving us their email address? What other ways, maybe that's just it, but, or what other ways should we be, you know, if there's not all that much signal um, or if we're trying to make a case with support for our boss and mm-hmm. we're like, okay, I need to separate signal from noise here and I need to show that this actually is going to be a long game and they want results like tomorrow. <laughs> what ways can we can we track and measure results? Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is, with any new thing you do, you should keep doing what's working and leave a little space for a test. You shouldn't, you shouldn't leave this talk right now and say, we're ditching social, we're ditching you know, our ads, and we're just going all on, on search. That shouldn't be the case. You should say, hey, we're, we're leaving 10% of my time where we can write an article a week or an article even in a month you know, or something like that. And we're going to start building out this, this strategy. As you do, you can start to, to look at things like, yeah, organic search traffic. So if you're using a, a tool like Google Analytics or HubSpot or something like that, you can see how much of your traffic is from organic search. You can also then see which of your keywords, if you're using a tool like Moz that like we talked about, that you can see which of your articles are ranking for certain keywords and how high are you ranking in them. Um, just as a thought, like as you're, as you're working through your, your articles, you want to get as many as you can, obviously, to the first spot. But the first goal is get them to the top 10, right? Like if they're, if they're in the top 20, try to move them to top 10. If they're in, you know, like 40 plus, like it's, it's going to be a while until you start to see, excuse me, any, any traffic to them. Because most people are just looking at the first 10 results. Most people just look at the first result. And so whenever possible, you want to find those articles as you start building them up. And, and move them up in those rankings because it means you'll be able to see them. And so anything that's that's 40 plus, try to get it in that top 40, get it to the top 20, move those that are in the top 10 up to the top four. And obviously those that are in second place to first, even that makes a big difference. And so seeing that your your results are going up in in the search rankings is a, is a way to measure it. Seeing just your overall search traffic as well as the leads that are coming in. And, and then also you can see if you're using or kind of like a tracking software, you can also see where, does, where did new donors originate? Like, do we have donors that we can track back and see like, hey, they originally came into our website through organic search. That's when you, you know, after a while can start to see like, hey, we're getting donors this way as well. Yeah. And so those are great ways to track it. Cool. Is there anyone in the room who wants to do a short exercise, mute yourself, come on camera, and we'll figure out some some long tails and short tails just really quick over over four to five minutes here. Anybody anybody brave enough to want to do that? If not, we've got a fictitious charity here in the Build Good Fundraising Podcast and in the Build Good Academy called Caring Hearts. So Cameron, Caring Hearts is led by fictitious charity ED, Amy Stevens. And what Karen Hearts does is they help women and single moms who are fleeing 
sort of abuse at home or facing some sort of abusive relationship or trauma. So they are a shelter where people can come to for immediate help and protection, but then also long-term recovery and housing. That is, that's a fictitious charity we often use as an example. So if we were Amy Stevens at Caring Hearts, how can we start to figure out, you know, let's just figure out like, like short, short tail and, and long tail stuff here and, and, and do a quick yeah. exercise. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the first place, you know, I would do more research before I'd make these final decisions, but like, for sure, like something like domestic violence, it seems like, you know, short tail, like, you know, d- domestic violence, like help or something along those lines. Right. And the, the longer tail, like I just typed it here into Google, you know, and the first things I'm seeing are like shelters or domestic violence shelter here in Nashville and stuff like that, or the hotline or resources or statistics. There's also domestic violence awareness month, things like that. Right. So if you start to create resources around some of those things, this is what people are searching for. That would be a really good place to start. Right. You should use more in-depth tools to keep building out, but like, this is a good place to start to say, one, let's use the tools, but also let's just think about it and brainstorm together. Okay. Well, what, what types of resources would be really helpful to people who are in, in the scenario? Also, not just, for people who are searching for help, but also those who are trying to help their family members or their friends and so forth too. And so you start to think about, okay, I think, I think one, let's create resources that will help those that we're serving, but also that will help bring in new, new supporters and help us grow and help us help more people. Right. And so I would, I would think too, like, just to clarify, this doesn't mean you stop content like you should still tell great stories, right? Like you could still use your blog or wherever you're posting these to tell stories of people who've gone through your program, even though that's not going to rank, right? That's okay. But, But then I would say, so include more content like that. I would then, one thing that's really helpful, by the way, once you start to kind of build this stuff out is telling Google and users which pages should rank for each of those things. So making sure you're sending links between your articles to to these other pages. So as I write out like domestic violence shelters here in Nashville, for instance, say that we're a local charity, then I would also from, I would also include the link to the hotline page, you know, and on the hotline page, I would say, you know, like, here's the hotline, here's what to call. But also if you're looking for immediate support, like go to, go to one of these places and I would link back to the domestic violence shelter page. Right. And uh, the list of all of those also, as people are looking for stats, I would also include those things and I would be linking back and forth between pages. One other great thing you can do is if you don't have the great resources on your website, send people to other places. This can be, it can feel a little bit weird. Like, oh, it makes sense that I would link to my website, but like, why would I link out to other people? Well, if your website, it's kind of like, what is it? Progressive that you see the insurance and you go to their website and they tell you the stats of everybody else's, like the rates that other people would give you, even if they weren't the best, like, like, oh, well, then I trust them more. You know, you go into a grocery store and they don't have what you're looking for and they tell you their competitor down the street has it. Now you like trust them more. You know what I mean? And so that's something that as a, as an, a person searching helps, but Google also likes that you're a non-biased source of the truth. Right. And so it, a good place to start for some of these things as you're gathering resources, if you don't have the best resources yet, could be to compile a bunch of resources that are other places and uh, put them together. I did this uh, on my website. I wrote an article about like the top nonprofit conferences, right? And for a while, it was kind of like in the top 10, but like it wasn't getting a ton of traffic. Uh, but then what I decided to do is I, I found more conferences and I found them through other, other people's lists, like people that were ranking above me. And I actually was just like, well, let me just give them credit. You know what I mean? Like, let me just link at the bottom, like, Hey, check out whole whale was one of them, or like, I think fundraise or some, one of those, right. Like a uh, classy had, a, had one. And so I just started linking to these other resources while also adding to my existing one. And now sometimes I get the first spot and like, I did other things to optimize it, but like, things like that really helped where I could link out to other resources and show, Hey, not only am I a good site for finding some of these things, but I'll show you other places too that can help with your search ranking, but it also just helps take the burden off of you to like have all the best answers, great resources that link to other places. And so I would find other great domestic violence resources online for this, this organization link from lists of things, as well as to great, articles and downloads from other websites as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a good example because you've got two audiences. If you're caring hearts, you've got, you actually want women to find you who are fleeing a situation. They want to easy to find, like they know where to go. You want to be the place to go to. At the same time, your other audience is like people who may want to support this, right? So you're optimizing for two different audiences. And a lot of nonprofits are any nonprofit who has any earned revenue. Now, universities struggle with this, right? Do we optimize for finding new students or do we optimize for donors or do we optimize for like which audiences? Do we do we try to to capture more of? Hey man, thanks for thanks for hanging out with us today. This is part one. Of we're course. doing a part two, and part two we're gonna focus more on donor journeys and and some some creative ideas around that. That's happening later this summer. Thank you all for being in the room. That is all for today. Here's my short action plan for you, and it's to sign up for Moz, see what pages that you already have are ranking well. And then number three, the pages are already ranking well. Just like see if you can improve them, copy them, do something similar. But, but three is just use the simple tools we talked about today. Google searches, even questions your donors are asking you. If you get phone calls from donors that have questions, or maybe you already have an FAQ section on your website, you've already thought about some content that people search for. Just try to come up with content pillars that you can create some content around and let that be your guide as you create fresh content for your website. Well, as always, thank you for hanging out with us around the fundraising campfire. If you want to be part of future Build Good Lives, just go to buildgood.com. There's many different places to put in your email address. The big secret is that it all just goes into one place and you get invited to future Build Good Lives and you'll also get some helpful fundraising tips. If you're listening to this, you're my kind of people. I'm your kind of people. Thank you for building good in the world. I'm in your corner cheering you on. 